Um, you know, you get uh, you get the best of the best, but you also get the worst of the worst because you're you're not only in the spotlight, but you're also in the target site. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like walking around with a bullseye on your back a yeah. little bit yeah. too. So. Yeah. You have to kind of roll with the punches. You have to realize that the higher you climb up the pole, the cleaner shot they have at your ass. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Beverly Hills <laughs> Plastic Surgery Podcast. Now, I'm kidding. It's the Rhino Frosty Podcast, but I've got the great honor of having Jay Calvert on the show today. Great to be here, Cameron. Very excited to to chit chat with you a little bit about revision rhinoplasty. Uh, you know, your podcast has taken off; it's doing great, and uh, love listening to it. You know, it's very focused, obviously, on the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery podcast. We're all over the place. No, absolutely, you guys, and I mean, your audience is also it's like so different. I mean, we've got this little rhinoplasty world yeah. that we're living in, eh? Yeah, and that's the thing. Somebody asked me, "How many people do you think are really serious about rhinoplasty around the world?" And I said, possibly 3,000. And one of our other colleagues was like, I think it's even less. Wow. There's just not that many people that no, no. spend this kind of time, energy, and effort really focusing on nasal surgery. It's hard. Yeah. So before we get into the revision stuff, just a few questions on like your, your guys' vision for the podcast. Is it more a patient information portal, would you say? Or more aimed at, at, at the specialist plastic surgeons? Well, it's a little both. Okay. I mean, obviously, we do it for patient information. If you listen to some of the titles, it's like Rhinoplasty 101. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, Breast Augmentation 101. Yeah. We have uh, what post-op instructions for rhinoplasty patients. Yeah. These podcasts are really patient-focused, and they, they attract patients. But there's also a lot of plastic surgeons that go through their training programs, and they don't know how to manage post-op rhinoplasty patients Absolutely. when they finish the residency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a big resident following okay. with our podcast. Okay. Okay. Uh, people like one of the residents said that he blew the in-service exam out of the water because he listened to our podcast. Perfect. And it's, he said it's all practical stuff that you just don't learn yeah. in residency, which yeah. is bizarre. You know, you don't know how to do a consultation. You it's, don't the, know. it's strange that as private practitioners, we teaching guys... Yeah, that they don't learn that in the in their training, as it were. No. So, so tell me, but for the listeners, so I mean, this is listened to maybe a hundred countries around the world now. What is it like being a plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills? Well, it's it's exciting, uh, which is good and bad. <laughs> um, you know, you get uh, you get the best of the best, but you also get the worst of the worst because you're you're not only in the spotlight, but you're also in the target site. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like walking around with a bullseye on your back a little yeah. bit, yeah. too. So yeah. you have to kind of roll with the punches. You have to realize that the higher you climb up the pole, the cleaner shot they have at your ass. So you no, want to. Uh, I love, love this. <laughs> it's so true, right? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, it's yeah. like, OK, well, you want to be out there. Well, guess what? Yeah. You know, yeah. people are going to take shots at you. You know, the, the trolls are real. Uh, you just have to kind of understand that with the territory of being in that environment which is intense mm. you know patients come to beverly hills because they want the ultimate plastic surgery experience yes, yes they want it to be the plastic surgical dream yeah that they had of you know perfect rhinoplasty no matter what nose they come in with if they get a facelift they want to be you know yeah. turning back the clock 20 years they yeah, they yeah. don't want average results that's not exactly. why you go to beverly exactly. hills yeah. and pay those prices yeah and truthfully, it, it makes you better as a surgeon because your tolerances are, are very small. You have, to, you have to perform. Absolutely. Yeah. It's tough. Jay, another question. You were president of uh, the Rhinoplasty Society. Now, we're actually here in Berlin at the third IMRS meeting, which is the combination of a few Rhinoplasty Societies, one of those being the, the Rhinoplasty Society from the States and us as Saucer and the Europeans, etc. What was your time like for leading such a like a, how can I best say it? Like it's an important society. Well, I led during the pandemic. Yeah. So I'm also the only rhinoplasty society president that served two terms uh, because the first term I didn't get to have my meeting. Yeah. And that's sort of the whole point is that you get to be in control of your meeting yeah. and you get to invite the president's lecturer and you give your keynote address. And so uh, to do it two years in a row during the pandemic was actually a really important point because... Yeah. 
you know, where did COVID hang out? It hangs out in the nose. So how do you operate on patients that may or may not have COVID when you suspect yeah. that it yeah. could be anybody that has it? And so we came up with guidelines. We did testing. It was a very intense time yeah. to be president, yeah. even though I wasn't an on-site president. In fact, I gave my president's lecture via Zoom. Wow. Yeah. Sure. Okay, let's climb into this revision rhinoplasty bit. So, you know, in a way, you could generalize and say anyone can with enough training can do a primary rhinoplasty. But when it comes to revision, that's a different game. Yeah, it's a different operation. And I think possibly also with the new wave of uh, preservation rhinoplasty, there's a new type of revision you're gonna learn as well. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts about all of this. Yeah, I mean, so for the listeners, I mean, revision rhinoplasty is not the same as primary. Primary, you're operating on a nose that's never had surgery. Uh, there's, you know, presumably no scar tissue. And I think, Traumatic rhinoplasty is a different category also yeah. because it has different complications and different uh, nuances to make the result turn out. So I don't want to get into that, but we'll just stick yeah. with revision. Revision, you're fighting against the old operation and yeah. especially the patients who've come in for revision rhinoplasty uh, from another surgeon. I mean, your own revisions are also another topic. So we'll stick with you know, this patient has had a rhinoplasty they're not happy with somewhere else and they're coming to you for the revision. Uh, you're up against it a little bit because they already don't trust that it's going to turn out right. They didn't get the result they were looking for the first time around. And so now they're seeking your help as the revision surgeon. And from my standpoint, I, I know I'm coming from behind because the last surgeon told them, hey, this is going to be great. It's going to turn out. It's going to, yeah, you're going yeah, to love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now here's me going like, okay, well, I'm the revision expert and this is what I can do. So I, I kind of have to, you know, there's a, there's a trust issue that you have to approach first with the yeah. patient. And then, of course, there's what can you actually do for them? Because the, yes. the level of damage to every nose Absolutely. is different. Yeah, yeah. And you can't always help everyone. And especially, I think, the pressure so much more in Beverly Hills because you're getting someone who has maybe had a botched nose job or someone who's just not quite happy and they want this perfection. And, you know, it's in a way, I'll, I just think of like Cindy Crawford with a mole on the side of her cheek. Everyone knows her, but there's that slight something that actually is a character trait. Right. But people want this absolute perfection. Yeah. I mean, I think by the time they get to me, they know that's not happening. Really? So. Typically, one of the things that we do is when people call in for, or they come through, most of our leads come in now through a website, you know, yeah. through a contact form yeah. uh, or through Instagram, and uh, the, they use the contact forms that are there. Uh, we send them the podcast about revision rhinoplasty. And in that podcast, I tell people, if you can live with your result, then live with it because the revision process is not great and it yeah. doesn't have any guarantees and it's harder than the primary. And I really discourage people from having revision rhinoplasty unless they have a clear path to success. Yes. If, they, if, yes. if the surgeon and the patient together can't see the clear path to success with a revision, you shouldn't embark on that journey. Yeah. You know, and I'm, so, really, I'm really clear about that. So we'll, we'll, for the listeners, I'm going to put that link on our um, podcast for the one we're running now. Okay. For the revision podcast on Beverly Hills podcast, definitely. So please yeah. just click on that link and listen to that. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, like one of my patients was like, so during that podcast, you say, uh, by the way, this sucks three times. <laughs> I said, yeah, it does. It does. It does suck. <laughs> like it's swelling and, you know, you can get your result, but yeah, like yeah. It, it's not fun. And no. it's not the same as the primary no, rhinoplasty no. process. You have to yeah. be up for this. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Last last question about the revisions because we've got to we got to get cracking and we have got lots more teaching to do at this yeah. congress. Is when it comes to harvesting cartilage for revisions, do you do you so you sometimes use the ear cartilage or is most of the time the rib cartilage? I really prefer the rib cartilage. Yeah. The uh, the strength and the long term success, uh, the ease of using it um, is just and the volume that you get with. Uh, yeah. I like the eighth rib. Yeah. Uh, I know some of our colleagues like the ninth and some like the seventh yeah. and some like to harvest the sixth up in the inframammary fold. I like the eighth rib cartilage and it gives me tons of material, straight yeah. grafts. It's great. Um, but yeah, I will use ear if I need a composite graft. If okay. I need, I'll be quick to go to the ear cartilage for that. Yeah. 
I won't use the ear cartilage for structural things such as lateral curl strut grafts or yeah. septal extension. Well, I'll use it for septal extension once in yeah. a while, but I, I'm really, I love the rib and I'll use cadaver. I'll get the order of, uh, of preference. Uh, septum if they have it, yep. if they don't have it, which they usually don't, then it's rib cartilage. If they don't have their rib, then it's cadaver rib cartilage. And then I'm into ear sure. cartilage after that. Awesome. That's Jay. Thanks, man. It's such a nice time to chat to you and Absolutely. catch up and uh, well done on that, that podcast. You guys are running, man. It's, it's inspired me when I listen to you guys to also do something with this, our little podcast. So oh, it's been great. Yeah. I, I love, you know, you can jump on your podcast and get some great rhinoplasty tips and you get it from the, you know, really from the experts. And that's, Absolutely. that's sort of the big, the big win for your podcast is you're getting people that are really talking in long form about how they do it. And that's, yeah. that's hard to find. Yeah. Cool. So guys, thanks for listening and tune in again next week.